Hey guys, JC Peretz here of allstarcharts.com and welcome to the show. Shout out Stock Charts TV for having me on. Shout out David Keller, what's up? So listen, since we've been doing this for the last, I don't know, four or five months or so, what's been the goal? Three things. Number one, let's make sure there's a lesson. Because let's say you hate my charts, everything I say is completely wrong. At least there's a good lesson you could take out of it. And then number two, what do we want to do? Let's dive into the charts. What are we seeing? What's going on? Anything good? Good ideas, good trends, trends changing. So we dive into the charts. And then number three, let's take some questions. That's what this is all about. You guys are really smart. I know that for a fact. Over the years, I've gotten some amazing emails, heads up about interesting ETFs and trends and individual stocks that weren't on our radar for whatever reason. And it's in fact, it's really helpful, these questions, because that's how we uh, sort of change parameters to certain scans. Because when a, a name pops up, you know, and we go back to the team, it's like, how come this name didn't come up in the scan? It's like, oh, because we we're measuring 52 week highs or we we're measuring all time highs. And that's why. So it really helps us, you know, sort of change the parameters around on our scans to really make it as hard as possible for us to miss something. But we still do every time. I mean, it's always going to be the case, obviously. And that's where you guys come in to help fill in the missing pieces. So I really appreciate it. Keep firing them in. And we'll get to the questions uh, in a little bit. Okay, so first, what is the lesson? You know, I was just with the team over the last couple of days. Straza drove down, Giancarlo out from California. Greg drove up and we we're really talking. And, and what keeps coming up is bases, large bases. The bigger the base, the higher in space. That's how I learned it from the great Luis Yamada. And when I go to Luis and I say, Luis, where'd you learn that from? The bigger the base, the higher in space. And she says she learned it from Alan Shaw, uh, who, by the way, started his career in 1958. So I go to Alan. I'm like, hey, Alan, Luis says that she learned the bigger the base, the higher in space from you. And Alan's like, that's right. And I'm like, did you make that up? He goes, no way. He starts cracking up. I'm like, where did that come from? He's like, oh, I learned it from the old timers when I started working on Wall Street in the late 50s. So these principles of supply and demand, these dynamics that create these, what we refer to as bases, uh, Edwards and McGee back in the 1940s would refer to something like this as a saucer bottom. Uh, some of my more contemporary friends might label it a Kardashian bottom, big round bottom, big bases with explosive resolutions. And that's really the key because the, the resolutions out of these bases tend to persist much longer than investors are willing to accept. Most investors sell too early coming out of these bases. Most investors are fighting trends coming out of these big bases and are trying to look for a mean reversion. It's just, they happen, but that's just not characteristic. It's not uh, something you're going to find a lot when coming out of big bases. Quite the opposite. You're going to get explosive resolutions. We're going to talk about Ethereum breaking out of that monster base and what we've seen. And these principles of supply and demand go back 100 years, maybe longer. Way before there was the Dogecoin, right? But those principles of supply and demand driven by human psychology, you and me, remain the same markets evolve new asset classes appear but you and me crazy between the ears doesn't change so you see the same patterns regardless of the asset class even cryptocurrencies go back you know a great example look at gold late 90s early 2000s look at that base look at that big bottoming process look what happened after that classic base just saw it in ethereum as well look at tech on a relative basis you know, bottoming out, that was like a 10-year base, 12-year base, 13-year base, something like that. I don't have a chart in front of me. Big, huge base is my point. And then how did tech do after that? What a monster, right? So lesson today, look for the bases. Big, big bases. Breaking out, making new highs. We want to buy those. All right. That's my spiel for the day. I hope that that was good. So if you hate the rest of my charts, at least you got, at least you got a good lesson. Look for big bases. Trust me. I'm telling you guys. I'm telling you. All right. So we had our monthly conference call earlier this week. Um, our monthly strategy session, uh, we like to call it, because what we're looking at is we are looking at monthly, new monthly data. The end of April this year, we have new monthly candlesticks, uh, new monthly line charts here. We're looking at the S&P closing at all-time monthly closing highs. Uh, gold and, and bonds just not doing that. You know, you could really see these long-term trends, right? This is this, this trend's been in place for a year, over a year, where they're selling bonds, they're selling gold. There's no need for those things, right? Bigger picture, I should say. I should emphasize. 
Uh, stocks making new highs, right? Classic. All right. What's changed? When we zoom in a little closer, what are we seeing here? Gold stopped going down. Gold stopped going down. Bonds stopped going down. Japanese yen stopped going down. We haven't seen that in a while, right? So something, something a little different. What else is going on? Consumer staples, not underperforming. But when the black line's going up, those are consumer staple stocks underperforming, which is consistent with an environment that stocks are doing well, right? So uh, this is consumer staples relative strength upside down. So as the black line goes up, staples are underperforming. As the black line goes down, like it did a little over a year ago, that means staples are outperforming. And when staples are outperforming, that's consistent with an environment that stocks are under pressure, right? So that's why these two lines look the same. Now, what's different here? Higher highs in the S&P 500, lower highs in the ratio, meaning that consumer staples have been outperforming. And that is not a characteristic of an environment where stocks are doing well. Quite the opposite. By the way, if you're interested in these charts, email info at allstarcharts.com. Make sure to use the password, value menu. So info at allstarcharts.com, but you have to use the password to make sure you get the right deck. Password is value menu. All right, look at the S&P 500 running into our targets. Mission accomplished. That was a heck of a trade. To be honest, got here a little quicker than I thought. <laughs> right? Full disclosure. Uh, but hey, you know, the, the market doesn't care how long it was, JC thought it was going to take the market to get here. Market's going to do what it wants. So why these levels? Why are they so important? Well, we're taking the extension levels from the 2000 and 2007 highs. Right? So as you can see here in 2015, this is where the stock market stopped going up. Right here, right? The first extension level. Not a coincidence. And we rallied from there and stopped going up where? at the same extension level, right? Little failed breakout last year and now really got going finally this year and hit that next target. So the stock market's gonna take a breather, take a break like we've been, you know, we've been saying, like it's been doing, maybe not, it's not showing up in the S&P 500, but you're seeing it certainly in the individual components as, uh, as uh, we discussed breath and I'll show you in a minute. But our targets are being hit. So if the market was gonna correct like it did in 2015, like it did in 2018, this would be a perfectly logical place for it to do so. Does it have to do that from here? No. Would it be, would it make perfect sense? Yes. Uh, meanwhile, of all the sectors in the S&P 500, it's the industrials that have the highest um, correlation with, let me just, uh, let me just back out, just show you guys the deck so you can see the divergence. Uh, industrials have the highest correlation with the S&P 500 of all of the sectors. And industrials are hitting our upside objectives, right? Mission accomplished. So if industrials are below 101 and a half, I think the I think it's uh, the the risk is to the downside. So if you're super bullish here, you think stocks continue just keep going higher, uh, you really want to see industrials holding above 101 and a half. Below 101 and a half, things get a little hairy. What else is going on? High beta is underperforming. This has been a beta chase for the last year. High beta, tremendous outperformer, as stocks did really well off the lows after the virus lows last year. And what are we seeing now? High beta is underperforming. Haven't seen that in a while. What about Aussie yen? Not making new highs either, at least not yet. So you really want to see Aussie yen make new highs. You really want to see high beta break out on a relative basis to confirm what the S&P 500 is doing, and that's not happening. So if you're looking for deterioration underneath the surface that is being hidden by the S&P 500 market cap weighted index, I think uh, here are two good ones showing you that divergence. Now, does that mean the bigger picture, the trend has changed? Absolutely not. Uh, the overwhelming amount of evidence continues to point to this is an ongoing structural bull market. These monthly uh, charts really, really show that nothing's changed. Uh, still upside in the Dow, still upside in the transports. So I just want to reiterate that we're talking two different time horizons. Bigger picture, the trend is up. When this choppy mess of a market is over, I do think we resolve higher. The question is still, how long is it going to take? Right? How long is it going to take? So I think this really speaks to that uh, outperformance out of value. Look at the New York Stock Exchange composite breaking out, right? Making new all-time highs. You're just not seeing that in the NASDAQ, right? So you're seeing a lot of overwhelming strength in the New York Stock Exchange. And let's remember that over half of the components of the New York Stock, of the, over, half the, over half of the largest 100 components of the New York Stock Exchange composite are foreign companies, international. So you're really seeing that exposure to value take over in that particular index, while the NASDAQ bigger picture is in an uptrend, short term it's in a choppy mess. Here you can just see the cues in a choppy mess. And let's take a look at the internals. Look at the advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange making new highs. Advanced decline line for the NASDAQ uh, just rolling over, right? Big, big difference between the two. 
a lot of growth, a lot of value, right? Big, big difference. So now let's take a look at the cues. This is our alternate view where we're looking at closing prices. You know, rather than just taking absolute highs and lows, I've learned to sort of let the market tell us which levels it thinks are the most important levels. And this is that. This is sort of catering to what the market is telling us versus telling what the market what to do. And if, if it's like this, then the NASDAQ is a short. The Nasdaq's a short if it's like this. Bearish momentum divergence, upside objectives being met, potential failed breakout. And then if you take it just weekly closes of the Nasdaq 100 QQQ, here's your three peak divergence, as they call it. Here's your extension levels getting hit. And the trade's very simple. If the QQQs are below 338, you're short. It's that simple. There is no reason to be short the Qs if it is above 338. Below 338, love it as a short, taking profits near 275. That's the target there. So I like the Qs short only, to be clear, only if we're below 338 do I like the Qs short. Uh, above that, all bets are off. And then you can see the breadth deterioration here. Look at the spike in new 21-day lows in the NASDAQ. We haven't got a spike in new lows on any time frame in any index except the NASDAQ. Think about that. That's the relative weakness. Notice how you're getting just fewer and fewer new 21-day lows on uh, the New York Stock Exchange. And you're getting a spike in the NASDAQ in new lows, right? It's different there. Small caps continue to underperform, still stuck below the February highs. So just like the NASDAQ, if we're below the February highs, you're short. Uh, if you want to be short the small caps, if we're below the February highs, I don't have a problem with that either. The NASDAQ just a little cleaner for me and, and a worse performer, right, for that matter. Uh, but the small caps are right there, second worst performer of any, of any group. Um, and if we're below the February lows, not only do we not want to be long, uh, excuse me, February lows, February highs. So if we're uh, below the February highs, not only do we not want to be long, uh, a short position is fine. Makes sense to me. You can really see it on the list of new highs. Look at the S&P 500 large caps making more new highs. Mid caps aren't that bad. Look at small caps. Just no new highs. There's just nothing going on there, right? Showing that weakness. You can also see it on the, uh, on the 52 week highs of the industry groups. Notice how the large cap industry groups are fine, making new highs, you know, in terms of the mid caps, not the end of the world, but look at small caps. There are just no small cap industry groups making new highs. None. Um, actually, I think the answer is, I think the answer is none. <laughs> uh, so there's an issue there. And then it, with, here's the alternate view of the Russell 2000, where we take monthly closing highs in 2007, monthly closing lows in 2009, extend from there, where does it take us? where small caps started to uh, underperform and stopped going up in February. Maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe. I don't think it is. I really don't. I don't think it is. Um, so if we're below the February highs, if you want to be short small caps, I'm cool with that. Uh, makes sense. Above that, we're making new highs in the NASDAQ and the small caps above the February highs can't be short. So why do I not think it's the end of the world? Why do I think that any short position should be tactical only and uh, bigger picture, we resolve higher ultimately, maybe later this year, maybe even next year. I don't know how long it's going to take. We're just not getting an expansion of new lows. A little bit in the NASDAQ, you know, but we're just not seeing it. Here's a Russell 3000. This is 90, approximately 98% of all investable assets in the U.S. equities market. We're just not getting more new lows. Look at small caps, just not getting more new lows. And then here's the look at uh, growth value. Right? Really just monster tops going back to last year. Monster tops in growth versus value. And the cheat code here is tech versus financials, right? Because in growth, you get a ton of tech, obviously. I think 40% tech, something like that. Um, then in value, you're going to get a lot of financials. In growth, you're just not going to get any financials, right? So this, this is sort of the cheat code of this particular ratio. I mean, you can add uh, energy and industrials to value for sure. You can add some of the discretionaries and communications to growth. But, you know, you want a, a quick back of the napkin math. Tech versus financials will get you done. And they look toppy. I mean, they do. You know, there's nothing to see here. And... You know, we've had a little bit of a mean reversion, as you can see here in the large caps, and in particular the mega caps in growth versus value. But look at the small cap. When you go down the cap scale, the, the, the rebound in small cap growth relative to value was much more muted. And internationally as well. You're just seeing the countries with the most amount of value exposure, Canada, Europe, right, doing very, very well. So it's really, really interesting. By the way, again, if you're interested in these slides, info at allstarcharts.com, password, value menu, that's the password because this is the uh, it's the market, right? We have a menu of value stocks that we want to take advantage of. So value menu, the uh, password there. And I can't help but have a conversation about value and, and bigger picture uptrends. 
without talking about financials. Breaking out of a 14-year base. So tactically, are we looking for shorts? Sure. We raising cash, been raising cash? Sure. Looking for alternative investments, Ethereum, and things of that nature? Most definitely. But that doesn't change the fact that financials are breaking out of a 14-year base. And it's incredibly difficult to have a structurally bearish viewpoint on equities bigger picture if financials are doing that i just don't see it i don't see it so I, I don't think you could be end of the world gloom and doom you want to put on a tactical short love it i actually really like it uh nice risk reward nothing wrong with that but that doesn't change the bigger picture speaking of value new recovery highs for both the crb index and crude oil right all value Right, a lot of these value names. Now, crude oil is messy, still below this downtrend from the last ten years. However, look how many times we keep knocking on that door. Right, it's only polite to knock a few times before you go storming in. One, two, three, four. Literally, as I'm recording this, crude oil right near sixty-six again. It's like Brett Gardner with the Yankees banging. Have you seen that meme? He's just banging his bat up against the uh, <laughs> up against the dugout roof. Uh, or the ceiling of the dugout, man, uh, it's hilarious. And that's how I look at uh, crude oil. It just keeps banging the bat up against the, you know, the dugout. And I think ultimately we break out. So when you start seeing crude oil with a 67, 68 handle, I think it's off to the races. 76 is next and probably into the 80s after that. Um, so definitely, I, th I think you got to be bullish oil. Look at what copper's doing, new highs, lumber, new highs. Got to believe oil's probably next. Uh, I like that trade. So let's take a look at some of these energy stocks. Uh, the XLE, the energy sector index, getting back to those former lows, right? Right around 51 or so and running into some trouble. So let's look inside. I like this Exxon back above those former lows. We're looking at 56 bucks. If Exxon's above 56, I think you own it. Got to own it, right? Got to own it. Um, you know, this could be a double, right? Depending on your time horizon. Why can't we get back up to these former highs? I think we can. So, but we only want to be long Exxon if it's above 56. If not, you can't own it. Chevron, same thing at 100. Chevron's above 100. I love it. Love it long with a target back up those near, back to those highs. And by the way, if we do get up to those highs, and I think we do, I think ultimately we break out to new all-time highs and Chevron completes a 10-year base. How bullish is that? And you know the best part, the risk is very minimal because we only want to be long Chevron if it's above 100. If it's not, it's somebody else's problem. Here's the uh, explorers and producers. These are the EMP names. The ETF is XOP. So look at the lows back in 09. Look at the lows in 2016. That broke last year, late 2019, early 2020. Collapsed. And now we're back to the scene of the crime. If you start to see the XOP holding above 92, that's bullish energy. You got to be looking at the explorers and producers. Let's take a look at a few. Here's EOG resources. 72 is the level there. Those are the back of the 08 highs. So if EOG is below 72, leave it alone. But above 72, I like it long with a retest of those former highs. All right, 115, 120, why not? Murphy, 15 is the level there. That puts us back above all that former support. We're holding. If we're above 15, I like Murphy long with a target of 36. And Oxy, 24 and a half. Those are the June highs from last summer. If we're above those June highs. We have a higher low, baby. Higher lows, higher highs. We call those uptrends where I came from. 24 and a half, that's the level. If we're above that, I like Oxy long with a target of 40. Oxy trades warrants too, by the way. So if uh, if this juice ain't, ain't enough for you, you could really juice it up on the warrants. And then let's talk about the big bases. Multi-year base in Ethereum relative to Bitcoin. Hello. Monster base. The bigger the base, the higher in space. That's how I learned it. That's how Louise Yamada taught me. That's how Alan Shaw taught her. And that's how the, the old timers taught uh, Alan in, in the late 50s, early 60s. Right? Bigger the base, the higher in space. Bitcoin was down in the month of April for the first time since last September. Ethereum, on the other hand, seven months in a row of positive months for Ethereum. Breaking out of this base. Can we get back up to those former highs in Ethereum relative to Bitcoin? I, I, I would have a hard time betting against that, right? That's just not something I want to bet against. Seems to me the bet here is that Ethereum versus Bitcoin does get back up to those former highs and then probably ultimately breaks out. 
That's what this looks like to me. How long does it take? I don't know. Seems to me that the crypto space is achieving our targets a lot faster than <laughs> some of these other asset classes. So I'm open-minded to this potentially happening quicker than I than you know one I might anticipate if this was maybe a utility stock, right? For example, that's not going to move. It's not going to be as high beta. So that's what this looks like to me. So listen, guys, if you're interested in these slides, want to do some of your own charting, I encourage you email info at allstarcharts.com. Make sure to use the password value menu. Info at allstarcharts.com, password value menu. So listen, you know, this environment has been choppy. I think as investors, we have to be thankful that we have alternatives so that, you know, because I know a lot of traders that are being stubborn. They're like, oh, I only trade growth stocks. Like, all right, bro. I don't know why. There's plenty of other stuff to trade. Oh, I'm a growth investor. It's like, what, is, what does that even mean? That just means like you have like really bad recency bias. Why are you a growth investor? Because growth stocks have done so well recently. Is that is that why? Oh, were you a real estate investor also back in 06, right? So for me, I think it's silly. I think we need to keep an open mind. And rather than trying to fight it, embrace it and be thankful that we've had things like Ethereum and even the Dogecoin or, you know, um, Bitcoin before that and some of these others, um, you know, while it versus getting chopped up in growth stocks, which I know a lot of people are, particularly American investors, particularly young American investors that are so used to uh, the success. They haven't realized that there are different market environments. But when you do this long enough, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember back in the day when emerging markets were doing well. Yeah, I remember that. Kids these days weren't around for that. They don't know. Back in the day where financials would be going up every day, Merrill Lynch, this is before Goldman uh, was public, like Merrill, Lehman, uh, 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 Bank of New York Mellon, um, what's the other one? Uh, U.S. Bank Corp, right? All these old school names, names that don't exist anymore, obviously, like Lehman and Bear Stearns and some of these others. Uh, these things were monsters. But the kids these days, they don't remember that. So um, I encourage you, if you're, if you're a newer investor, go back and, and, and study prior market cycles so you can see just how different they were so that it helps you recognize that in the future, we're going to have different market environments that we have today. And those are going to be different than the ones that we had last year and the year before that and the year before that. Some of the years might rhyme. Like you might be like, oh, this reminds me of back in 1958. You know, you're going to have those. I do it myself. This reminds me a lot of 04, 05, 06. Right after that initial thrust off the lows, value stocks really participating, the energy names doing well, financials, industrials, just big companies that take stuff out of the ground, the stuff themselves that they're taking out of the ground, the countries that they're taking stuff out of the ground from, like all those things early in my career, like those were the monsters. Like tech did all right, but that wasn't where you wanted to be back then. You wanted to be in the, uh, in the value names. It reminds me of this environment. And there are differences. There always are. But it kind of rhymes. All right, let's answer some questions. JC, are there any growth stocks worth buying or stay completely away? I think there are growth stocks to own. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, just because you're shorting the NASDAQ doesn't mean you can't buy growth stocks. In the same way that in the, over the last few years, growth stocks have been the big winners. It doesn't mean that there weren't value stocks that also did well. It was just easier to find winners in growth. That's all it is. We all have winners that came out of value. Most of us do anyway, right? A lot of people do. There were huge winners, but growth was as a group outperforming. So I think there are. In fact, we have a we have a report coming today, uh, the two to one hundred club that specifically looks for stocks that can scale from two billion to one hundred billion dollar in market cap. We call it two to one hundred club, and those are by definition semis and cloud computing and. Uh, solar stocks, and these are the types of industries that can actually scale to 100 billion pretty quickly. A utility stock is not going to do that, so they're not on that scan, <laughs> right? They're very specific industry groups. All right. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. I do think there are growth stocks to buy. What I would encourage you to do is just be extra disciplined with risk management. I feel like you always should be disciplined with risk management, but like extra. Just make sure you identify where you're wrong. In the off chance that you got it wrong, just make sure that you know you're wrong quickly um, and make sure that the potential profit is exponentially greater than the risk you're taking, right? Like anything else. All right, JC, isn't this the perfect time for gold to do well with all the other commodities going up and crypto too? Yeah, in theory. Yeah. 
for sure. In theory, gold should be doing fantastic, right? Gold should be the best asset in the world, in theory, but it's not, right? And as the great Yogi Berra, I, I'm going to butcher what he said, but something along the lines of, in theory, practice and theory are the same, but not in practice, right? Something like that. <laughs> uh, shout out Yogi Berra, um, one of the great philosophers of our time. He also said that nobody goes to that restaurant anymore. It's always too crowded. Classic, classic yogi. Um, so yeah, in theory, gold should be doing well, but it's not. You know, I think if it's above 1800, you can own it. That's the trade. Uh, we like the gold miners. It's been working. The trade was to be long the GDX. If it's above 31, um, that trade's been working. The GLD, or the gold in general, the futures to break out above 1800. We haven't seen it yet. I mean, we're looking for it. The strength in silver and in platinum certainly points to that. And if you get a dollar rollover, I don't think that's going to hurt either. So that's what we're looking at in gold, but it just hasn't broken out yet. So I think we could be patient, but I do think it's coming. So that's definitely something that we're watching. Um, and at what point do rates become a bigger problem for stocks? You know, I ask this question a lot. Like, is it 3%? Is it 4%? Like, where do rates really become a problem for investors? Where, And I think that the, 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 big, the best answer I've gotten, and I've asked this to a lot of my smartest friends because... I don't know the answer myself. I mean, technically nobody does, but I, I would argue some of my friends have a probably a stronger opinion on the subject than than I would. Uh, so anyway, so I asked them, right? Stay. I try to stay in my lane. I know what I know, and what, when I don't know something, I go and I ask somebody who I feel uh, is better uh, better at that than me. And the answer that I'm consistently getting from my smartest friends is that it's not so much a specific level in rates as it is the rate of acceleration of rates. Like if they're just ripping and money's getting destroyed, the money's flowing out of bonds, that's gonna trickle into uh, into equities. Cause there's, like it did earlier this year, when rates just skyrocketed and bond market got destroyed, like that, you saw that trickle into other asset classes. Like whenever there's crazy volatility, when I, I shouldn't say crazy volatility, but whenever there's a, a spike in volatility, an unusual spike in volatility in any asset class. It can be in precious metals. It can be in currency. It can be in the, it's going to affect the other asset classes. It's not, oh, you know, the stock is down today because the CEO said something. No, it's down today because stocks are getting hit because some, you know, there's a, a hurricane going on in the bond market, right? So it's important to understand these intermarket relationships, but in the case of versus instead of just, thinking about a specific level where it's like, oh, when that level's triggered, that's gonna be a problem. It's more so the rate, like if it's a slow rise, you know, it shouldn't be the end of the world. It shouldn't really impact other, uh, other markets, at least not anytime soon. It's more so the rate of acceleration. So that's how I look at that. Um, and just wanna reiterate on that note, uh, one of my smart friends who I did ask that question to, Paul Sienna, you know, uh, he told me, well, we're about to drop the podcast this week, so uh, look out for that. Search All Star Charts on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. And he said, JC, if investors would just focus on price behavior anywhere near as much as they dissect every word coming from the Fed, they'd be much better off. <laughs> I like Paul. Uh, I thought that was well said. Um, and that's really what it speaks to is really understanding and following the price. You know, don't worry so much about the Fed. Worry about what the market thinks about the Fed. You got all these eggheads or so-called eggheads that are, you know, trying to dissect every word that the Fed is saying. Oh my God, they changed this word. They left that word. Just watch the market. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm JC Peretz. Uh, email info at allstarcharts.com. Make sure to use the password value menu uh, to get the slides. Uh, say what's up on the interwebs at All Star Charts on Twitter, Stock Twits, Instagram, YouTube, and Clubhouse. Thanks, everybody. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.